five, four, three, two, one. But who's counting, right? And his name is Major. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Major Garrett from the nation's capital. Major, fantastic. It's the takeout. This is a major achievement. With CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent. Major Garrett. Yes, CBS. Yes, hi. Major Garrett. Major, that's nonsense. And you should know better. Is Major out of the doghouse? <laughs> the answer is yes. Welcome to the very best part of my broadcast week. I'm Major Garrett. You already knew that. Welcome to the Rayburn House Office Building. We are in the very nice office of Stacy Plaskett, who is a delegate for the U.S. Virgin Islands. We're going to get into what the delegate powers are or are not in the House of Representatives and the story on how she, a Brooklyn native, got to be the delegate of the U.S. Virgin Islands in a moment. But, Stacey, it's great to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for being here. Welcome to our office, my our home. Thank you so much. For our purposes, ladies and gentlemen, Stacey Plaskett sits uh, on a pretty important subcommittee in the Judiciary Committee, the Select Committee on the so-called weaponization of the federal government. Now, if the federal government is being weaponized, that's an issue. And if people are being victimized by that weaponization, that's an issue. We're going to try to find out what her thoughts are about whether or not that's a real thing or not. You might recall several weeks ago we had Jim Jordan on this program, chairman of the Judiciary Committee and also, as it turns out, chair of this select committee. So you've heard both sides. You will hear both sides. That's what our show is about. Digging in and giving both sides a chance to explain their perspectives. You might also remember Stacey Plaskett was an impeachment manager in the second impeachment of former President Trump. And Stacey, I don't need to tell you there are no end of legal issues swirling around the former president. And because Jim Jordan has been involved in this this week, I want to ask you about Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan District Attorney, and what you think may or may not or should or should not happen with that case and the former president. Okay. Um, regarding the case with the president, um, thanks for letting me give uh, some thoughts on what I have about that. You know, <clears throat> I, as, an, as a former prosecutor, as an attorney, find it difficult in this elected position to really comment extensively on ongoing investigations. We can surmise, and as politicians, of course, we give an opinion on something, but to really inject ourselves into investigations, I think, is an inappropriate um, melding of the separation of powers of our respective, particularly when that is an issue that's going on not even at the federal level and federal prosecution, but at the state uh, level. You know, my thought is that Alvin Bragg is the district attorney of a county of New York, uh, which has over three million residents, larger than some states, and he has been duly elected by the people of that jurisdiction to uh, prosecute crimes in his area, to fight it in many different ways, whether it's in uh, reducing crime through uh, recidivism programs or uh, community programs or uh, prosecuting homicides, guns, whatever. Uh, Alan Bragg, we know, has a long history of white collar uh, prosecution as well. And he did that at the um, U.S. Attorney's Office of the Southern, or some say the Sovereign District of New York. Yeah, yeah. Um, he did it as uh, with the Attorney General's Office in New York. And I think he is going to be very uh, circumspect, very methodical in the prosecution of any individual for a white collar place because of his prior experience, and especially if it is a former president of the United States, because it is precedent setting. Mm -hmm. It is something that cannot be done lightly. Um, but I also believe that we have a former president who was unlike any other former president that we have, and he, by his own actions, has kind of broken the mold of what has and has not been done with a prior president. Um, and so, if in fact he believes that he has sufficient evidence uh, to demonstrate that the president has in fact committed a crime that occurred in his district, the Manhattan County uh, of New York, the New York County of New York City, then he has the prerogative, the, the prerogative to do that. And for the... He would be duty-bound. He would be duty-bound to do it. But now, you know, they have prosecutorial discretion yes, whether they are or are not going to prosecute something. But for the Speaker of the House and the Chair of Judiciary 
to attempt to intimidate him not to prosecute those cases, I believe is the weaponization of the federal government. And when you say intimidation, is that what you mean by the letter sent the letter to sent. Alvin Bragg asking him to provide documents exactly. and testimony, et cetera? Exactly. While the investigation is going on, while the grand jury is still impaneled, because they have not as yet, uh, to my understanding, issued a true bill or uh, issued an indictment of the former president. So I believe that is a real intimidation by uh, some of the highest, you know, the third in line to the presidency to try to intimidate uh, a duly elected prosecutor. And do you think there would have been a different reaction had, let's say, someone empowered on the Democratic side had tried to intimidate someone or a prosecutor aligned or theoretically elected in a Republican jurisdiction? Do you think Republicans would have said, that's a grotesque federal overreach? It, uh, uh, I'm it, sure it they steps would. on federalism, uh, you know, et, cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to say what they would or wouldn't done. I'm saying what they are doing right now. Right? I could not have seen um, former speakers of the House, Nancy Pelosi, or even uh, a John Boehner or a Paul Ryan engaged in this kind of activity. Do you think there's any reason why Alvin Bragg ought to submit to these requests for either testimony or documents? N definitely not now. Um, definitely not while the criminal investigation is still going on. Uh, what would he do? Come and say, I can't say anything because the criminal investigation is ongoing? That's a waste of his time. Let the man do his job and we will see the outcome of it. And he has to then present sufficient evidence for a jury in a criminal investigation to find the individual guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a pretty high standard. So I think by watching that, we will in fact know. Do you detect, as I do, Congresswoman, a sense of national anxiety about this, about the prospect of a former president being indicted? Uh, well, I think our, there's a national anxiety surrounding the former president in, its, in his totality, in his prior actions, in his future actions, and demonstrated by uh, his tweets, his, you know, uh, his comments on his own social media platform, I think that everyone has anxiety about what he has done and what he continues to do. You know, last week, telling individuals that I am going to be indicted on Tuesday. And arrested. And arrested. Uh, and telling them to come out to support him, I, I think is just uh, beyond the pale. To protest, he said. Yes. And there are those who would defend the former president and say, protesting is an American right. He didn't call for violence. He is, but explicitly. why is he so special that Americans should be engaged in protesting for him? There are so many issues that Americans need to protest about, and there are so many issues that Americans are much more uh, concerned with, you know, the cost of living, uh, being able to secure affordable housing, to buy a home, the American dream, safety of their children in schools. Those are the everyday issues that Americans are concerned with. I think it's the height of narcissism that the president believes that American people should rally specifically around him. So you mentioned Jim Jordan. He is the chair of the Judiciary Committee. Um, he's also the chair of this Select Committee on Weaponization. Mm -hmm. Is weaponization of the federal government a real thing? I think that there are instances potentially where the federal government has been used inappropriately and potentially politicized um, or has biases to go after individuals. We've seen that throughout its history, right? Um, and so, yes. Is that a real thing? Yes, potentially it's a real thing. Uh, you know, it's certainly look, a real thing in the past. There are sure, law, Qua I mean, Quantel you, Pro, you know, yes. all kinds of things that the FBI has done in its past under Herbert Hoover, et cetera. Um, even in the last administration, you know, there are issues that one would deem uh, weaponization of the federal government. But uh, to engage in a two year discussion of that. And thus far, the issues that uh, my colleague, the chairman, has brought forward to me are not an appropriate use of taxpayer dollars in looking for weaponization. And you've raised some issues about uh, witnesses described as whistleblowers. You think they're not. We'll get into that in a second. I'm Major Garrett. We're in the Rayburn House office building. Stacy Plaskett is our special guest. More for segment two of the takeout. The camera's over there, Major, not over there. Right over there in just one minute. Thanks. Ah, oh, you know, I, I think I stayed where I was and I looked around and the Republican Party wasn't around me anymore.
from CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome back. Trust me, I know where the camera is. I just was looking at the clock over there. It's a little bug of mine, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Stacy Plaskett is our special guest. We're in our office at the Rayburn House office building. Stacy, tell us a little bit about yourself. Born in Brooklyn? Sure. Um, yep. Born in New York City. Born mm -hmm. in Brooklyn. Your um, dad was an NYPD uh, police officer? My dad officer? did uh, 29 years, 8 months in the New York City Police Department. My mother worked civil servant in New York City. Court clerk? Court clerk, started out as a court officer before that, you know, the whole bit. Uh, I went to schools in New York, um, you know, went away for high school. France, and, right? Well, yeah, went to boarding school in Connecticut and then uh, went to Georgetown, was in the Foreign Service School there, uh, then went to undergrad um, at, at undergrad and then law school here as well at American University uh, and went back to New York as a prosecutor in the Bronx worked for a spin-off of McKinsey, and then ended up back in D.C., worked on the Ethics Committee, worked for Rob Portman, mm -hmm. uh, great man, was a congressman at the time, mm -hmm. worked for uh, member Lamar Smith from Texas, mm -hmm. and then went to the Justice Department. For those of my audience who might remember, those are both Republicans, and your bio says you were a Republican until 2008. Sure. What happened? Sure. Ah, you know, I, I think I stayed where I was, and I looked around, and the Republican Party wasn't around me anymore. Where did it um, go? Uh, I think it went to the right. Uh, I think it became engaged in issues that I thought were not uh, in sync with where I had been and where I thought the party had been. You know, I believe in small government and uh, streamlining processes in the federal government to support economic development and business. Uh, a lot more states' rights and, uh, you know, injection of issues and, and processes at the state level rather than at the federal level. And I think that the party got engaged in culture wars and started making Americans, pitting Americans against one another over issues that were really not the bread and butter issues that I felt were important to myself and to those people that were around me. Is so uh, former left President party. Trump a demonstrable zenith of that process? I think he's uh, someone who saw issues that were swirling within our country, fears, legitimate fears that some Americans had, uh, some Americans uh, angst and concern, and some anger, and harnessed that all to himself to support his own endeavors, yes. What did it mean to you that from 2016 to 2020, after the country saw four years of President Trump Roughly 13 million more Americans voted for him the second time than the first time. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, you know, quite often people will vote against their own interests. If packaged in a way that makes them believe that what someone is trying to sell them is, is the right thing. You know, you said I grew up in Brooklyn. Um, you know, us Brooklynites are always watching out for people in Manhattan trying to hustle us. Uh, and I think he had a great hustle and people will buy things that they don't necessarily need or are good for them if, you know, the messaging comes correct. How did you become delegate for the U.S. Virgin Islands mm. and why? Yeah, so um, my family is from the Virgin Islands. My parents, both my parents, came to, migrated to New York, left the Virgin Islands and came up to New York in the 1950s. They were part of a pretty substantial migration of people uh, during a time period when there weren't a lot of jobs. They're both older siblings, uh, and so this was a place to work and send money back home, New York. You know, I can always remember cousins, uncles living with us in New York. You know, my uncle did his residency on, by sleeping on our couch in New York, or cousins living with us. Uh, but there was always a sense that these were people who needed our support, who sacrificed a lot, you know, whether it was my parents sending checks or packages back. And I guess in 2004, when I decided to move down, I felt I was the package that was being sent down of my parents' work and their dreams to, you know, my, my plan major was to go down there, work in private practice, and write books and lead a quiet life. And I um, volunteered with a lot of organizations, became involved through my husband in politics, who's also from the Virgin Islands, and uh, he got tired of me complaining and said, you really need to stop complaining. Nobody wants to hear that. Why don't you run for office? And the office that makes sense is the member of Congress. You worked as a staffer. 
you understand the issues, your lawyer, um, please go do that. Go for it. Go for it, and mm -hmm. we'll, we'll back you up. What are your powers in the United States House of Representatives? Sure. You know, I always, people try to say that members from the territories have no voting power, but really it's limited voting power. Uh, we, as we sponsor legislation the same way that other members do, co-sponsor, speak on the floor, um, debate, give floor speeches, etc. In committee, we have the full authority that members have. Your vote counts the same in a committee vote. Vote counts the same mm -hmm. in the committee. You main, uh, gain seniority in the same way, uh, you know, uh, and but then on the floor, we vote on amendments and we do not vote on final passage of legislation. When so, the House is in the Committee of the Whole. When the House is in the Committee of the Whole, we those are there. Remembering their civics from either mm. high school or college. We vote on Committee of the Whole. We do not vote on final passage. But I think, you know, we've done members of the territories a good job of trying to inject ourselves mm -hmm. in other areas. We don't, I think uh, the greatest impediment we have is that we don't have Senate representation. And so members of the territory really have to do a good job with finding allies on the Senate. I go over to the Senate floor and try and talk to members of the Senate about issues that there might be some alignment, whether it's Alaska mm -hmm. as a non-contiguous state or Hawaii or New York or Florida because of the large Caribbean uh, members of their own constituency to try and support our own legislation. Should the District of Columbia be a state? I believe so. You know, I think that people, when they hear the District of Columbia, they think all of the District of Columbia. And what they do not recognize is that the federal area would still be cut out of that, uh, being part of the District of Columbia. But many pe members of Congress don't go outside of Capitol Hill. And they don't realize that there are entire neighborhoods of individuals in Northwest and Northeast and Southwest, Southeast, that are going about their every day working and producing, um, being fiscally responsible, uh, paying taxes. And for that reason, I believe that they should be a state. How about Puerto Rico? Uh, I think that Puerto Rico has gained the mature maturity to be a state. Let's remember that when the United States had territories, the idea had always been for them to eventually become a state. Mature into a state. Mature into a state. And so we, the federal government, would inject programs into those territories to try and incentivize and accelerate them being a state, whether it's the Homestead Act, by encouraging Americans to go to those territories and build and grow, or through other means that we have utilized in the toolbox of the federal government to try and bring places like Louisiana, right? The Louisiana Purchase out west, go west, young man, uh, for those places to become a state. When we purchased or con conquered areas that were no longer part of the United States contiguously, but interestingly, did not look like um, what Americans think Americans are, then we have put those areas in a perpetual state of territorial status. And most of that was codified in the insular cases at the turn of the century. Um, the same justices at the Supreme Court who wrote Plessy v. Ferguson, right, separate but equal, also decided the insular cases, which in some parts actually say people who reside in the territories are savage individuals who cannot understand Anglo-Saxon principles of law and therefore are not in a place as yet to be able to move towards being a state, which I think is very ironic that you would call us not being able to understand Anglo-Saxon principles of law when one of the greatest Americans, Alexander Hamilton, is from the island that I grew up on and actually wrote our Constitution. Um, so that creates all kinds of, you know, a, a, interesting A significant contributor to the Constitution. I think James Madison was saying Well, James was... Madison, the two of them wrote it together <laughs> along with the Federalist Papers. They wrote the Federalist papers. papers for sure, yes. But, you know, Hamilton was engaged no in doubt, the Constitution no doubt. as well. No doubt. Uh, Stacey Plaskett is our special guest. We're in her office here in the Rayburn House office building. Interestingly, as I mentioned before, Jim Jordan's office, Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, is right down the hall, and I uh -huh. gather that when you have letters for him, you hand deliver them. We just walk them over. I mean, it's right there. There's no, of course, you email, but you know, yeah. there's always a hard it's right copy. Down, that goes. It's literally right down the and hall. We're going to get into that. It's 7:30 this morning. Saw him. You know, he's he's a he's a gym dude. He goes and works out. I am not. Uh, and as I'm coming in, dressed with my coffee, I saw him going to 
be, be a good person by going to the gym. More on that and other topics when we come back. I'm Major Garrett, The Takeout, coming your way in just a second. When I would talk to uh, Republican senators, I, they'd say to me, Stacey, you're doing a good job. This evidence is outstanding and you've made your case. From CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome back. Yes, Jim Jordan's a gym head. I think you would agree with that. But you don't agree on what this Committee of Weapons Nation has so far been about. Right. On this program several weeks ago, Jim Jordan said, we have many, many whistleblowers. Yeah. You don't agree they're whistleblowers. Tell my audience why. Well, according to the law, there are certain elements that one needs to, to have presented to, in fact, be a whistleblower. And for the issues that these individuals have brought forward, they have not been granted whistleblower status by the agencies in which they allege wrongdoing. And in fact, the allegations that they have put forward, they do not have firsthand knowledge of. These are just issues that they have raised, that they have heard about, um, are not firsthand um, experience for it, and it, they're not facts and evidence. Um, and so that makes it they're legally- allegations. Well, it's not just allegations. It would be an allegation for me to say it, and I was the person that it happened to. Mm -hmm. But these are things that they did not even happen to them. These are things that they heard of. These are hearsay, uh, you know, in legal parlance, these are hearsay allegations, and it's which are not even necessarily true. For example, mm -hmm. one of the issues that they talk about is that uh, it was unfair for them to have a SWAT team go after an American to uh, go armed, to issue a warrant against an individual in Florida. Um, what they did not put forward is that that individual was alleged to have been armed and was in fact a member of the Oath Keepers. So yes, that is someone who should in fact. Much of the witnesses that Mr. Jordan has tried to bring forward are individuals who do not believe that January 6th was in fact an insurrection. Um, and much of it appears to be uh, a individuals to try and gloss over what happened Are they on, on that day. Are the, the Down the rabbit hole. These potential witnesses. These in witnesses. I have sent him a letter actually mm -hmm. today. I've read, I've read the letter. Saying, listen. You actually you, want them to be called. I'll bring them in, out into the public. Let's hear them. You've already uh, done transcribed interviews of these individuals. Let the public the see them. Let's let the public see them. And let the them. committee be able to question exactly. them across the aisle. Exactly. Is what you want, because what do you think is going to happen if that happens? I think they will look ridiculous, and people will see that that was a waste of taxpayers' dollars. That there are things that we could look into. Uh, I've given Mr. Jordan, the chair, a list of, I think, are areas where maybe even we could have some. I know some he would never touch, but some may be areas that we could both agree on might be interesting areas of investigation that he has not responded to me about. Mm -hmm. When you were a part of the team that managed the Senate trial for former President Trump mm -hmm. in the second impeachment, mm -hmm. did you think then that there was any possibility of obtaining a conviction? Sure, you don't, you don't go into a fight or a trial to lose. Um, that's not how I'm made. Of course, it's not a trial court. It's a political court. And you knew that and everyone knew right, that. Right, right. But I think that, you know, we had sufficient evidence um, to do that. But of course, when you're in the Senate, and interestingly with January 6th, it's very unique, right? Because you're, uh, the jurors are also the witnesses um, to the crime that you are alleging having take place, but they're also political um, individuals themselves. Mm -hmm. As you heard, I was a Republican, and part of my job on the impeachment team was not to, to translate things into Republican speak, to not sound so much like Democrats all the time in what we were saying, and to actually talk with the senators, the Republican senators, as, you, as the trial um, took place. You know, it's, it's a strange feeling as a former prosecutor to, in the middle of a, of a trial, to have your jury come to you, jurors come to you, 
and be like, I like that, I didn't like that, can you talk right. some more about this, can you give us some more information? I mean, weird, right? But that's how it is. And when I would talk to uh, Republican senators, I, they'd say to me, Stacey, you're doing a good job. This evidence is outstanding and you've made your case. And so I would say, so are you going to vote to... Um, well, are you going to vote to convict? And they're like, no, I can't do that. I can't do that. And so I would then come to them, because remember, it's a two-part vote. Mm -hmm. If the vote is first to convict, which requires the two-thirds, then you could, the next vote would be to disqualify from running from office again, which only requires a majority. And so I would say, well, sir, ma'am, how about a uh, senator, why don't you vote to convict? And when we get to the next vote, you don't have to, you don't have to vote with us. Uh, on that vote because we won't need those votes. And they're like, yeah, I've done the whip and you're not going to get to that number. Um, I don't think you'll get to the number to be able to do that. And so there were political calculations on individuals' parts who I believe knew that we had made the case, but politically were unwilling to do that. Mm -hmm. What do you think the country will inherit as a result of those political calculations? Well, thankfully, I believe we also had the uh, select committee on January 6th immediately thereafter, which also did, I felt, put, we had a short span in which to conduct our case, and they had a much longer extended time to be able to put, as I say, meat on the bones of the skeleton that we presented to the American people. Uh, and so I think because of that and the fact that their witnesses were not Democratic witnesses. These were the president's own staff. These were his aides. These were his individuals um, making the case against the president that those individuals who made that calculation 50 years from now, that that will not look kind on them. Mm -hmm. So you're on the Intelligence Committee, correct? Mm -hmm. Are you satisfied with what you have heard as a member of that committee about classified documents and their handling or mishandling by the former president? Hmm. So, of course, now I have to be very careful in what I say. Um, I am satisfied that the branches of government which have been um, tasked with investigating that are doing their job. And I believe that you will see as we go into the Intelligence um, Appropriations Act of this upcoming fiscal year, that there will be additional, potentially additional safeguards that are put in place to ensure oh, that- Safeguards on whom? On classified material that- um, Clarifying their handling or, or, making or who's sure responsible that there are, or making sure that what there accountability are, is? Making sure that there are the necessary guardrails to ensure that you know we do not come to the place that we are. Because when you talk about the mishandling of classified documents, we're not just talking about President Trump, right? We also saw that the Vice President yep. Pence, uh, now President uh, Biden yep. also had that. I think what the issue has been in many people's mind with former President Trump is not the mishandling, but for me in particular, the obstruction in terms of the return of those documents. Let me stop you right there because we're speaking, uh, let me check my watch, what is today, the 23rd mm -hmm. of March? Within the most recent week or so, there's been significant developments in the appellate court here in Washington with documentation produced for the court and now one of the president's attorneys appearing before the court to explain, and the underlying question the court has, did the former president mislead or lie to his attorney and make false representations about those documents. How significant or insignificant do you find that to be? You know, you, the two people you don't ever lie to are your mother and your attorney. Um, and your attorney, because they also have a duty um, to advise you and direct you as your attorney. And I think this also goes, if that is in fact correct, that the president did do that, goes to show that this is an individual who is not concerned with the truth. And possibly not concerned with the law? Not concerned with uh, potentially, depending on what the classified material was, with the welfare of our national security 
and to those Americans who are out in the field protecting it in the intelligence community. That is the voice of Stacey Plaskett. We're in her office here in the Rayburn House office building, the fourth segment of The Takeout, and a continued conversation on this particular topic when we come back. I'm Major Garrett. This notion of, oh, we don't do that to former presidents, has been blown away, not by us, not by the institution, but by him. From CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome back to The Takeout. We're in the Rayburn House office building. Stacey Plaskett, delegate from the U.S. Virgin Islands, is our special guest. Um, in the minds of some Americans, they might say to themselves, classified docs, Pence, Biden, Trump, they're all the same. Uh-huh. You would say what? I would say no. Uh, I would say the... Would you say that as a lawyer or as a partisan Democrat? Because someone might answer, oh, of course she's going to say that. She's a Democrat. No, as a lawyer, as a former prosecutor, there's a huge difference in terms of intent. Uh, with Pence and President Biden, it appears from the evidence that is out there that these it was un in unintentional to retain these classified documents. Now, with President Trump, did he intend to take the documents, some being in his desk. Uh, and then, after having been told that you possibly have them, this is the worst part, uh, as, a, as looking at it as a lawyer, why did you not turn them over? Why did you fight? Why did the National Archives have to engage the Justice Department because you refused to give the documents And back. why does the evidence now suggest you either misled or intentionally lied to your lawyer? Exactly. In its representations to the court about right. what you did or didn't do and right. what your motives were or were not. Yes, I mean, listen. Let me ask you I this. Am, I am a Democrat. I've been a Republican. And I think that we have in President Trump an individual who is outside of the spectrum of what the presidency is supposed to have been. And so now this notion of oh, we don't do that to former presidents, has been blown away, not by us, not by the institution, but by him. If I hear you correctly, Stacey Plaskett, what you're saying is there's this understandable hesitation about going to this place. Of course. Indicting a former president. Of course. We're how, reluctant how, to do how it. Do, how we, do we, we look are, as America? We're traumatized by the very thought of it. The, the notion that... But if I hear you correctly, what you're saying, the fault is not with those who are reluctant or anxious about that. The fault is with someone who's putting us in a position to have to contemplate. Sure. I, as you, you, know, you know, I have quite a number of children. <laughs> and... The number's five, okay? <laughs> and look, if you can look you, it up. And if you have one who continually defies the rules, does that destroy the whole house? Do you let that one child do that? Do you not manage that one child differently at the behest of maintaining the house itself? So our house, this American house, which contains so many different people of different ideas and thoughts, have a greater responsibility to the house than we do to the individual, that know, one individual. I know you need to be careful on this, but I want to ask you, there's been a, I think it's fair to say, a media circus about Alvin Bragg and the Manhattan DA and the grand jury. It strikes me, Stacey Plaskett, that among the things that were more important or most important in the last week and a half in the legal history of former President Donald Trump, the classified document machinations are far more important. Well, I mean, when you think about, well, I, one would think um, a state or a county's prosecution as opposed to a Department of Justice, Maine Justice, uh, special prosecutor review, um, and one that involves classified documents and our national security and the safety of Americans abroad who are engaged in supporting that national security. Yeah, that's, a, that's pretty heavy. Um, and so looking to see what is going to happen there, I think is something that we should all be very concerned about. As well as, listen, we have not talked about Georgia. Go right ahead. Which is, you know, they're the prosecutor, the district attorney, mm -hmm. 
in Georgia is also reviewing, did this president weaponize his office and the office of the president to, to support a state certified election exactly. result? Exactly. As a lawyer, as someone who schooled in justice, do you have any problem with the chatability of some members of this special grand jury that was impaneled that will not make the ultimate decision? The DA, Fonnie Willis, will have to go to another regular grand jury, right. but a special grand jury was created to look into this, and five of them have now given interviews, mm -hmm. the four-person, quite publicly. Mm -hmm. Are you comfortable with that? I mean, it, it's something that you can't stop. Um, I think it makes her job tougher, and I'm sure it's something... Do you think sure it creates an opening for the defense, if there is a case brought? Not only that, but all you do. prosecutors... You do, so you do think it creates an opening? I think there's... Now they... I mean, they're, uh, they're, the information in a grand jury is available to the defense, so it's not as if they don't know, but they have some kind of thought, pro uh, thought of the, the thought processes of the grand jurors. I think that all prosecutors in working in a grand jury would like to keep their case close hold until they, in fact, do the indictment. And I think, uh, does this uh, accelerate her timeline? Uh, to be able to get this out before more individuals speak or before she can impanel mm -hmm. the next one to be able to do that indictment. I think for her it's a process issue. Right. It doesn't contaminate the evidence or the no. case. No, right. But it complicates things. It complicates things. Let me run a couple of quick Life things. Life is complicated. No doubt. A couple of things by you. TikTok. Are you happy with TikTok or do you want it banned? I want it banned. Why? Uh, you know, the notion that our greatest enemy at this point, China, has potential access to a third of Americans' 150 data. 150 million on the, on the app. That's, that's a very concerning. When the company says they don't have access to it, the, the data is all hived off. It's well, in I Texas. Oracle's we, got I it. I think we have you learned that, that the Chinese value. government is not necessarily the most truthful. Mm -hmm. So it would be okay for you to have it banned in America and those 150 million users of Are any of your children TikTok users? No. They're not. Interesting. No. Uh, uh, but, you know, I think that American innovation... Was that a family conversation? Yeah, it was kind of a family mandate. Uh, then, no, first there was a conversation, <laughs> then there was the mandate. Because yeah, I see the yeah. sign right behind you, the big boss. Right? <laughs> That's, you know, I, 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 I don't mandate many things to but you grown that. people. Understood. But I, and I think I, I'm grateful that I have young adult children, not children, but young adults, mm -hmm. who are my offspring. Mm -hmm. I don't know, what do you call them when they're, they're adults now? They're not your children anymore, but uh, <laughs> who are rational enough that when you give them sufficient evidence, mm -hmm. they're like, yeah, that's a problem. But I think what I was going to say is American ingenuity can create our own TikTok. One would think. Yeah. Algorithm can't be that hard. Uh, there has been information released uh, about a data breach affecting Lots of people on Capitol Hill, staff, and some members. Mm -hmm. Are you affected by that? Do you know anyone who has been? I don't. I don't know that I've been affected. You don't. Okay. So well, you're I have to not. Find out. Yeah, okay. I have not. You're that I'm aware notification. Of. Okay. But I and I don't know any member who has. Okay. Personally. Are you nervous that any further release of personal data on any member of Congress in this heightened threat environment, which is very real, all of you get briefed on it all the time, mm -hmm. creates a higher level of exposure and potential danger. Yeah, you know, I'm concerned about that kind of data breach. I'm concerned about my colleagues um, in terms of just the, the threats against us um, by other Americans. As you said, I'm on the same hallway with Jim Jordan, and last week I was very concerned because I saw Capitol Police outside of his office with an individual who was making threats against him. To me, that's, that's unfortunate. I, I don't like to board. see that across the board. Stacey Plaskett, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Stay tuned for the Takeout Outtake Especial, folks. That's coming up next. I have a thing for Spike Lee movies. Uh, he's been a great brother to me. From CBS News, this is The Takeout with Major Garrett. Welcome to your Takeout Outtake Especial. You know who I am. We're in the House Rayburn office building of Stacey Plaskett, U.S. Delegate from the Virgin Islands. It's great to be with you. So we do have fun and games questions. We'll okay. get to those in just one second, but a couple things on politics. 
Um, do you want President Biden to run for re-election? And if so, why? Yes. Uh, I think he's been doing a great job. I think he has brought us out of a horrendous time, both politically and in terms of the morale of this country, as well as a pandemic. I think uh, people were surprised, pleasantly surprised by the amount of bipartisan work that was able to be done in his first two years with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, the uh, CARES Act, uh, all of the other things, the bipartisan infrastructure plan, the omnibus legislation, and there's still work to do. So I'm hopeful that in the next two years more will be done. His galvanizing Europe uh, during U the Ukraine war. I think all of those demonstrate that this is a man who has utilize the countless number of years of his public service as a senator and as vice president to be able to take us through a specific period of time. And I don't believe we're completely out of that time. And so for those reasons, I think he should run again. Do you worry, do your constituents worry about his age? Uh, I think that one might just as a number worry about the age, but not all 20 year olds are bodies are the same, nor 50, nor 80 year olds. And I think he demonstrates that. You know, lucky for us in the Virgin Islands, particularly on St. Croix, we're where the president comes for his Easter and his Christmas. And so we see him in his walking, his bicycling, his, you know, um, beach time, whatever. And he looks in pretty good shape. Um, so here's the fun and game part of the program. Okay. We have three questions. We've asked every guest. The show is in its seventh year. By the way, I'm going to take a brief moment here. In the last couple of weeks, your humble host has been traveling the country, and many of you have stopped to tell me that you love the show. And I just want to let you know, you know who you are. Thank you. Nothing makes me happier than people who know what the show's about, get the vibe of the show, and appreciate what we try to accomplish. So thanks for telling me that. So the fun and games part of this three questions we ask everyone. Most influential book in your life and why? Mm -hmm. All-time favorite movie. Now, it doesn't have to be by a certain director. It can be the all, or you can do answer any way you want. And if you're flying back to the Virgin Islands, that's a somewhat long flight. Mm -hmm. And you're going to enjoy some music. I mean, really enjoy the music. Mm -hmm. What kind of music, artist, or genre is that most Ooh. likely to be? Okay, so the most influential book in my life, there's actually two. Um, the first one is Roots by Alex Haley, mm -hmm. which I read uh, when I was eight years old. Uh, and that was influential to me because, you know, it's a really thick book. It's about 500 pages or more. Uh, but two thirds of the book really recount that main character, Kunta Kinte's birth to adulthood, young adulthood in Africa. And so to, as a young child, hearing the complexity and the fullness of an African nation, his family life, his community, um, the rituals and stuff was just eye-opening to me. And it's why I ended up at Georgetown's Foreign Service School. Uh, the second one, which came a much later, is Henry Kissinger's book on diplomacy. It's got to be my all-time tome on how to conduct myself and the history of diplomacy in the world. Uh, how, how people, how nations interact with each other, how they advance their interest against and with one another is something that also kind of led me to the school that I was in. Do you hope someday to be a diplomat? Oh, no, I think that's a little past me, you know. Um, no, I uh, hope someday to be maybe a writer of history. Very good. Uh, All-time favorite movie? You know, I don't really have an all-time favorite movie. I am a big movie head. I love uh, watching movies. There is a plaque in this office that is yeah, some, you know, somewhat I have a, indicative. I, I, have a, I have a thing for Spike Lee movies. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been a great brother to me. And uh, he gave me a plaque of a street sign in Brooklyn, which, you know, we share a love of Brooklyn, uh, the do the right thing. And so, you know, as I said, as a young woman uh, in college, do his movie, She's Gotta Have It, was, you know, completely like, wow, that was very different, very empowering as a woman, having multiple guys that she's seeing and not seeing, and she's making the decision about mm -hmm. who she's sleeping with right. and not sleeping with. She's got with. agency, as we say. That's, yes. yeah, that's, that was pretty, like, 
Okay, okay, girl, I see you. Um, but I do love uh, action movies. Uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was probably one of my favorites. And I actually like the Bourne series as well. Jason Bourne, very yeah. good Bourne identity Jason and Bourne. all the like. Bourne supremacy, all of that. All right, favorite music? Uh, again, I'm a New Yorker. Yep. So rap, mm -hmm. what the kids would consider old school right now. Mm -hmm. Strictly East Coast. Drop some names. Uh, Nas, uh, KRS-One, um, you know, Jay-Z, and of course, may he rest in peace, Biggie. Mm -hmm. And so those, those are kind of what you'll hear me listening to, along with Neo Soul. I love the, the smooth sound of the young artists that are coming up, uh, Jasmine Sullivan, you know, Jill Scott, um, Maxwell, um, Raheem Devon, native Washingtonians, just that kind of vibe as well. Excellent. Stacey Plaska, it's been a pleasure hanging out. Thank you. That concludes your Takeout Outtake Especial. We'll see you next week.